Hey guys, this is Elise. Uh, I'm the organizer for the online event series Catholic and Christian Friends for Intersectional Racial Healing. This project's purpose is to show that talking about racial experiences does not have to be threatening for personal relationships like friendships and um, family relationships and neighborly relationships. I want to say we aren't trying to solve racism or make extravagant claims with what we're doing. We just want to encourage you all to reflect and prayerfully engage in love and respect about, uh, with love and respect about a topic that is very sensitive for just about everyone these days. In this video, my very good friends, Rebecca and Udi, are actually meeting for the first time to chat about this conversation, um, this talking point, and um, they're within two degrees of connection being friends with me. So um, we're all approaching this conversation as experts of our own personal narratives and our own personal experiences. And we're gonna dive into them, um, which were shared during the previous intro videos that you can see in this plant, the, the, I'm tripping over my words, in this channel's playlist. We'll spend about 20 minutes or so chatting and we hope that it'll encourage you. So with that, let's get started. Um, okay, I guess I'll start. <laughs> so, Elise, sorry, I don't know, is, am I introducing myself first or am I just jumping right into the question? Oh, I am so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, <laughs> this is a very candid moment um, that we are clearly, you know, friends. <laughs> So yeah, sure, you can introduce yourself and um, start us with the first question. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Udi. Um, I identify as Korean American. Um, my pronouns are she, her, her, hers. Um, and yeah, I think, um, so when I was watching Rebecca's video, um, one thing that um was a delight to me was hearing that her fish, her first missions trip was um to peru um and sorry i'm i'm like getting a little disoriented because i feel like i'm talking to the viewer but i also want to be talking to rebecca um, so <laughs> um first thing um rebecca and i did talk a little bit before this recording so i'm sorry if this moment is not candid but um Rebecca, I thought what was super cool was that both of us, uh, or that your first missions trip was to Peru, and that's where, like, you really encountered God, and I had a very similar experience, too. Like, my first missions trip um, was in the mountains of Peru, um, and I also really encountered God very powerfully there, um, so much so that I um, decided that I no longer wanted to pursue a career in art and design. Um, but rather I wanted to serve people. Um, and, and so that's my current profession right now. I'm a forensic interviewer for children. Um, and yeah, so I think as I was thinking about questions for you, um, one thing that kept coming back was um, that I was really curious about was just, um, you know, how does your racial and ethnic identity play into um, the work you do as a missionary? Um, or when you do missions, um, you know, like, how does it affect the work you do? How does it affect how people perceive you, et cetera? Yeah, I'm Rebecca. <laughs> I don't know if I have to say that. Um, and yeah, that, that just like makes me smile to hear that. And um, what's funny is that like, I was doing art in Peru and like, I mean, I don't know, a lot of things are happening in my mind right now, but um, yeah, okay. So anyway, I'm gonna answer the question. <laughs> so how does my racial slash ethnic identity play into like my missionary life, basically? I'm not a missionary, but I do like work in, um, I work in a middle school um, and I did a couple years of AmeriCorps service here in Columbus in schools. So I think I've, I think I mentioned that too in my intro video that like, I think service has, has also like been such a huge part of like my identity. And um, yeah, I mean, it's just so cool that like we both experienced that in Peru in the mountains 
that we both have like artistic identities maybe i don't know <laughs> and like want to serve people um and i think for me um i yeah i'm very like i'm so thankful that i got to like go on mission trips with that church and then i did also in college with a christian organization um and i feel and i mean i've learned a lot about like the missions field in general that's where like my thoughts are going to now um and i think as far as like my identity um like realistically like the the groups that i went on mission trips with were like majority white people and there's always like like when i was in peru i remember like people were like oh there's the gringos there and like i'm pretty sure that either meant like the white people or the foreigners and like but like when people would look at me they would be like they wouldn't like like stare at me um until i like started talking and they were like oh she can't speak spanish um but so like i don't know like I think that has come to an advantage that I'm like, I guess, racially ambiguous is how you would identify how I look. Um, and that happened too when I went to China in college as a, for another mission trip. Um, and like the part that we went to, they had, there were like a lot of minority ethnic groups too. So like, even though I looked brown, like it was kind of still like, oh, she's not from America or whatever um so I think I think that's been a blessing for me because like I don't like I hate to have like attention on me and like um yeah and like what I've learned about like missions trips is or like in missions like or the relationship is always like first and I and I and I think like God has used like the way that I look um, to like see more, like to make people feel more comfortable around me. Um, so I don't know, that's kind of where my thoughts went. I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> uh, yeah, was there another question to that or no? Um, I mean, I think, that that did answer my question i mean at the end of the day like i'm not looking for anything specific i just <laughs> want to hear more about you know like your experiences um but i think you know expanding on that my broader question is just like um i think because you kind of touched on this a little bit like we are made up of so many different identities um and i guess i'm really interested um in which identity or identities um, you're most aware of, depending on like what space you're in, whether that's like at home or with friends, at work, um, et cetera. Yeah, um, I can answer that. And I also had the same question basically for you when I watched your intro video, so you can answer it after me. Um, but I would say, um, yeah, first, yeah mainly like how i i think the way that like god has created me like ethnically racially um has been very unique and i think um yeah that's like one way like i think i interpret that as like god created me this way like even though i don't fit in like most like majority groups or even like minority groups like i'm so unique and like it's, I don't know, like that's something that reflects God, um, whatever that something is. Um, and that, so that is in general, like I would say I am aware of my identity that way a lot. Um, I think as a woman, I'm like, that's like a big part of my identity that I think a lot and I'm aware of. Um, on other other I, parts of my identity i would say like a bridge builder like a connector maybe like in the ways that i think or like that i like 
bring people together or work. Um, and I would say also artists, like I love to do art and um, it's a lot of ways I connect with God also. Um, and I think part of that is like because of that trip to Peru, like that was huge for me. Um, and yeah, so I think about all those identities pretty much everywhere I go, like at work, in my family, with my friends, um, as a Christian, yeah. And I think this is kind of a tangent, but another part of my identity is like being human. And I, that's not something that I've, I, I feel like I, as an adult, I'm like definitely learning more about like being a human means like you can never be, you're never gonna be perfect. Like you, there, you have flaws, like there's brokenness, like, forever until you get to heaven and um, that's just a random piece of identity that I thought about that was like oh I'm not like I don't love that part about myself but everybody's human here so yeah what about you and Elise you can a answer that too if you want <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so I think for me um I think I, I guess I'll just focus on like three spaces where my life majority or like ma takes place for most of the time. Um, and that would be, you know, with my family, um, at work and at church. Um, so I think with my family, um, a couple of my identities that are, um, that I'm like constantly aware of um, is, um, you know, being a Christian. Um, Cause I think within my family, um, I'm, especially among my siblings, like I'm the most active in my faith. Um, and actually like, I think from my parents' perspective, like I'm their, I'm their Christian daughter, you know, like of all four of their kids, like I'm the one that's really Christian. <laughs> um, and so I think like in that way, um, I'm really mindful of that identity, not just because like that's the identity that my parents gave me or like late, put on me but also because I do want to be a faithful witness to my siblings um and to my parents um because my family are the people who knows me so deeply you know they know my true colors they know who I am at my worst and who I can be at my best um and so I think um a part of me like wants to prove to them that like God's love is transformative which it is um but then when I fall into my old habits, I think I'm even harder on myself because it's like, man, I'm supposed to be this faithful witness to my family, but I'm just proving to them over and over again that like I'm the same old Udi that they've known my whole life. Um, so I think like that's one identity that I've really, um, that I'm always aware of when I'm with them. And I think another one is, yeah, my Korean identity too. Um, in my household, uh, my parents speak to me in Korean and I respond in English. So I can understand them, um, but I can't speak the language. Um, and so I think um, that is also an identity that is really um, challenging for me because I think on one hand, I feel really ashamed that um, I have lost so much of my Korean roots. Um, especially, you know, when it comes to like wanting to communicate with my grandparents who don't understand English very well and things like that. Um, but I think on the other hand too, like it is a source of pride um, because of the roots that I still have, you know, I think my parents um, really do a lot to teach uh, Korean culture to me and maintain some of those, um, you know, like really just beautiful parts of our Korean identity and our family. Um, and so I think I'm, I'm thankful when I think about, you know, just the history of what my family has gone through to bring me here. Um, I think at work, um, or I guess I think like anywhere I go um, where I'm meeting strangers um, or being with people who are outside of my core circle, like my Asian identity is very, um, I think it's weird because it's like, I don't really think about my Asian identity much, but I know that other people are looking at my Asian identity, right? Like when people see me, the immediate 
first thing they see is, oh, she's Asian, right? Maybe Chinese, maybe Japanese. Korean, what's that? You know, like, <laughs> I think that's, um, so it's, it's not that like I'm thinking about my Asian identity, but I, I am presuming that the other person is thinking of my Asian identity, if that makes sense. Um, but I think, yeah, I, at work, so at work, like that's definitely one part. Um, I think my age is also one thing that I'm really mindful of at my workplace, just because my coworkers are older. Um, and um, I work with kids. And so I'm constantly thinking, like with my coworkers, I'm constantly thinking like I'm the young one. And then when I work with um, the kids that I serve, I'm constantly thinking like I'm the older one. And so it's just this uh, different levels there. Um, and then at my church, so when I went to Korean Church of Columbus in high school, um, I think my Koreanness was definitely something that I thought about a lot. And I, I'm pretty sure I touched on that during my introduction video too. Um, just the idea of like not being Korean enough um, and um, being shamed by elders because I don't speak Korean, um, just experiences like that. Um, but right now, as I go to Harvest Mission Community Church in Ann Arbor, um, where it's um, it's a multiracial church, um, but still very heavily Asian. Um, but within the Asians, um, they're all of various nationalities. Um, and so I think in that space, like I'm not as mindful of my race um, and uh, my nationality, but um, I think that is a space where I really get to reflect more on the other identities um, that God has, um, made for me, um, whether that is just, you know, being his daughter, um, or, like, uh, the different talents and the passions that he's given me to, so I, I really do feel like at, um, HMCC, it's a special place where I can cultivate all of those things that I may normally not be able to in other spaces. <laughs> what do you thank you so much, and Rebecca, too, you know, I feel like, something that I'm like super touched by in this process because it's it's there there's no script you know we're we're just speaking as friends and um the main thing that we're watching out for is just each other's comfort and, and privacy and security like sense of safety as we're doing this um but it's not it's not a controlled narrative so I'm like I'm first of all I just want to say thank you so much again for like opening your hearts and um, through the foundation of our individual friendships that you're like so open and vulnerable with each other too. Um, you guys are both touching on so many things and like, I kind of have to ask like, what was the question again? Cause I don't even know what I'm answering anymore, <laughs> to be honest with you. Like, <laughs> um, the question was like, what parts of your identity do you notice the most in different spaces, I guess? Got it. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, <laughs> so <laughs> where do we start? <laughs> yeah. Now that I'm answering it, I'm realizing how big that is. Like when I was just like listening, I was like, mm -hmm, like, this is so beautiful and I'm enjoying like listening, <laughs> but like now that I have to answer it, um, it's kind of scary. So, <laughs> Um, I think, I guess like I, so like I, I kind of think in stories, not all the time, but sometimes, and right now I'm thinking in stories. So, um, I remember when I was really little, like before going to kindergarten, my grandmother would visit us and, well, but all, all of my relatives did. And she shared her stories about, um, she would share stories with me and I understood Korean um, English is my second language, and I actually wasn't allowed to go to kindergarten at the local public school because I, my English wasn't good enough. So they were like, sorry, you need to come back next year, um, learn some English, and then come back. So um, I understood like the things that she would say. And um, my parents just, my, my mom's an immigrant, so she talked to me in Korean all the time. It's not like she could just talk to me in English, and um, she immigrated as soon as she got married. So. Uh, and then I was like 
something something like a wedding night baby. I don't know if, like exactly, but anyhow, I don't really want to know. I just know I'm like close to around there. So anyways, um, her English wasn't that great. So I would hear a lot of Korean and that's why it's my first language at home. So anyway, she would come over and um, would be eating. And of course, being typical kids, we would like leave a couple, you know, things on the plate and be like, I'm done. And then she'd be like, finish your plate. And we're like, mm, we're full. I'm full. <laughs> it should be like, there are so many North Koreans who are going hungry, who are dying from starvation, who are scraping off bark from the trees to survive, to eat that, to eat weeds off the ground. And like, and on top of that, our own family is in North Korea. And it was just like, it changed my world to know that I, I had family members, you know, I was like three or four years old to know that I had family members who couldn't eat. And I was like leaving stuff on the plate. And, um, and then I was, as I was growing up, I heard Koreans and not just Koreans, but like some people say things like, Oh, North Korea, that's where the dictator is and the communists and this and that. And, you know, my, my father, he served in the U S Navy. So I also like, not only that, but I grew up in this town that was like on my, the house that I, that I grew up in was on the border of this, um, town called Lexington in Massachusetts and the battle of Lexington and Concord is how the revolutionary war started in the United States to then create the United States. And, and so like, I grew up so patriotic and I just like, even though like I had all these messages around me of what, you know, in retrospect, I realized I had a lot of external messages in the culture and among people that were saying like, you there's all these reasons why you should be ashamed to be whatever you are. And like, whether that's like being, having North Koreans in your family or like um, having North Korean blood and, and then like um, being Asian or being a girl or being whatever, like I had all these messages, but um, at the same time, I think in some ways because of where I grew up, I also had really strong messages of like, be proud of who you are, be thankful for who you are, be thankful for where you are, how you got here, the people that sacrificed to get to whatever your family has right now, whether that's a lot or a little, like there's so much to be grateful for. And so I was, I always grew up like really proud, but also very sensitively aware that there is lots of opportunities to be ashamed and then stagnant and not able to grow beyond that shame. And, um, and I don't know, I, I don't know if it's like my personality or what, but I, like when I get, whenever I have something to say, I end up finding a way to say it or I just say it. And um, I, I'm not really one to shrink away from challenges. So I, I, I feel like, you know, to answer your question, it's like, I could give like a lot of anecdotal pieces about how I feel in multiple spaces and then how people perceive me. But I think I want to start off by saying that piece is that um, there's like a, there's been a foundation that I've been really blessed to have of being really, really proud of proud, not based on like an ignorant pride of like, I am superior, but like pride based on gratitude um, that gave me a foundation to then counter messages of shame and counter messages of minimizing and um, putting me in a corner and, and making me silent and making me submissive or making me invisible. Like I had other things in my foundation and I, I realized that that's a blessing. Um, whether it's the blessing of having those pieces in my environment or it's the blessing of, of receiving that filter to, to process information through. Um, so, um, you know, when I, I think there's a couple connecting points that I just want to share a couple things. There's like, of course, as friends, we could talk about all of these things for hours, but um, for this video, I think I'll just share two other anecdotal moments to connect to what you're saying. Um, so, you know, Udi, when you were speaking about like 
that shame that people put on you of like not knowing Korean enough or not being Korean enough. And, um, and that pain that that's caused by that. Um, I, I really feel for you. Like I just like empathize and I connected with you and, um, cause I, I feel like, so when I was in college, um, we were celebrating one of the significant birthdays for my grandmother and I, and all the grandkids went around saying what they were thankful for about her and her life. And I recounted a lot of family stories that she had told me that brought us to where we are, that um, allowed us to even be who we are individually. And I, I recounted stories that involved my uncle, my aunt, my other aunt, my dad, my mom, my, my grandmother's siblings, um, her escape from North Korea, all these different stories. And my uncle was like, wow, you're a collector of stories. And um, I, I feel like, I, I feel like because I understand Korean and kind of the position I have in my family, I find myself understanding stories of um, different generations. And when I hear stories from people in a lot of like our generation who feel that pain of disconnect because of language or not understanding customs or not understanding the language and therefore not knowing the history. And the, and then the only thing that they receive is the shame is the judgment of like, you are something enough or you're not something enough. Um, I, I like really feel for that because I see that in my own cousins, in my own like siblings, there's discon there's points of disconnect because, because of that, that space that is just not understood. And then like for the older generations, based on when they immigrated, they are stuck in and they're most intimate with the history of the country that they came from when they had immigrated. And, and so there's divisions between immigrants too, based on like which decade did they, did they come, which year in which decade did they immigrate over? And so there's like these division points. And, um, and so there's a lot of opportunity for connection, but then there's also opportunity for disconnection. And sometimes the disconnections can feel more painful and more poignant, louder than the points of connection. Um, and so I just like, I really empathize and I really feel for that because that's a lonely place to be when there's disconnection um, and not knowing how to overcome that, how to, how to have a conversation for that. Um, and then for what you were speaking of, what you're both speaking of with ministry, I feel like a connection with um, both of you. And Rebecca, what you were sharing too about like that kind of nice ambiguity space, like ironically, like at least some, like somehow God has made that into a gift, into a blessing. Um, so, you know, like there's a lot of narratives about North Korea. And um, when I, I didn't plan this on purpose, but I, I wore this shirt today and it's connected to when I, um, this is a shirt that I wore connected to when I went abroad and I gave artist therapy to some North Korean defectors or refugees who had escaped and um, met over a hundred of them. And we were doing an intensive um, therapeutic and ministry camp. And, um, you know, there's so many opportunities to disconnect, but when they heard me speaking in Korean and I sound kind of silly when I talk in Korean, but, that I could still speak it and that I knew something about their history and that I had family who had escaped, there was a point of connection. And yet then like the, the big host organization, which is predominantly white, um, partnering with a predominantly Korean, like there were two hosting organizations working together, then I could also communicate with them. And, and so like, I feel like regardless of what like it's so relevant what our what our ethnic and racial and and like cultural like stuff is, and at the same time it's like in that ministry space something that I really resonated with both of what you were sharing is that whatever we have, God redeems it, God uses it, whether it's like stories of pain or or like blessings of certain skills and resources and talents, like God uses it, 
for his ministry. Like he's like, I want to be known. I'm going to make myself known through you and you are perfectly made to show me. And whatever that is, whether it's art or it's like speaking Spanish or speaking English or looking brown or looking whatever, like I'm going to use that. And then like, convey my love. And, um, I just think that's really beautiful. So I like really connected. And unfortunately I have to call time on myself (laughs) because I am the timekeeper. So, um, before I do that, I want to see, um, you know, just if either of you have any like closing comments or for this, you know, closing thoughts, um, before I, I give the exit little spiel. No, I wish this conversation never ended. Um, I think just hearing, yeah, more about you, Elise, and hearing your intro story. Um, and I also watched your testimony that you gave um, at the courthouse. I might be wrong. I don't know. State house. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I just like learning more about you. Like you definitely, I just, I feel like you're so courageous and bold and like you definitely go for it and like you've said that like you have a confidence that like I really admire um so it's just like great to get to know you more (laughs) um as we talk and um yeah I think like both of you have touched on um language and like I wish we could talk more about that because like that's something also that like can that is like wrapped up in like identity as well. Um, like I, like I was born in France and I spoke French as my first language. Um, and had we not like moved to the U.S., I maybe would have spoken Malagasy also. But like, obviously, the like language of wherever we were like took priority. Um, so now, like now, I speak English like more, and like. French is like second now, but, um, but yeah, I don't know. It's just like, I would love to hear more, maybe some other day or in the future, um, like how like language affects, cause I'm a very reflective and thoughtful person, obviously. So like, I feel like I think more in my thoughts than out loud. And so like language is a huge thing, but anyway, the, that's my closing comment. And I just hope we get to talk more like us three. Um, I think I just want to say, Rebecca, it was great meeting you um, and getting to know you a little more. Likewise, I wish we had more time to talk and share about our experiences. Um, But um, thank you, Elise, for hosting this. Um, And thank you both, Elise and Rebecca, for um, your brave vulnerability um, and just sharing from your heart. I think this has uh, been a lovely journey so far. And yeah, I really hope that there are more opportunities in the future. Thanks guys so much. You're so beautiful. I love you both. It is so much fun to introduce special friends to each other. And um, I always love doing that. So um, I'm so sorry you're going to cut it short. I, um, I hope that this video is encouraging for the viewers who are watching to know that, um, and and to give you some strength, to know that your voice matters, especially in conversations with friends, and um, that your experience is valid. You matter, and we all need to come together to make a better world. It takes all of us, even those who feel like they're the least or the the most um, not legitimate to have this conversation. I wanna encourage you all. So stay tuned for um, further conversation and we all wish you God bless.